be able to um, tune in then. The program today is particularly exciting to us for several reasons. Um, one, it's the final program that we have that's part of our current exhibition, Steve Marcus, Top Dog of Kosher Pop Art, which closes soon in November, um, on November 6th, actually. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, now's your chance. Um, and two, we are celebrating 135 years this year since the Eldridge Street Synagogue was born. And the museum is finally reopened to the public. Um, we reopened on June 21. And what was a synagogue built by immigrants for immigrants today, we've, even this year, we've already welcomed visitors from over 65 countries from all around the world and are continuing to share our incredible story um, with all of them. So we're able to celebrate this meaningfully and especially meaningfully since one of the descendants of our co-founder uh, is here tonight. So we're all here to meet the great, great, great grandson of Isaac Gellis. Isaac Gellis, who was born in 1849, the legendary kosher sausage king of New York, Isaac Gellis, and co-founder of the Eldridge Street Synagogue. Now, he is also named Isaac Gellis, the man that we are meeting today, um, and he also happens to be in the food business. So Isaac, um, he graduated from the Culinary Institute of America. Give everyone a wave, Isaac, so people don't get confused. Um, and he spent 13 years working in New York City restaurants. He's been at Boulay, he's been at The Modern, um, and he's also worked as the chef of culinary development for the Seidel Group. But most recently, he was the assistant culinary director of Aurora in the Caribbean. And he's opened, um, well, they, they've opened eight food and beverage outlets um, over their huge 350 acre property. So he really um, has seen a lot there. And incredibly during the heat of the pandemic, Isaac actually, while he was living in New York, he turned his Brooklyn apartment into a babka bakery and he raised um, around $10,000 in one month, which he donated to the NAACP and ACLU. So really incredible. And tonight he will be telling us about his journey in discovering his family history, what that's meant to him personally and as a chef, and how he's really reinvigorated his family legacy. That is the Isaac Gellis Delicatessen brand. And later on this evening, we will also be joined by Steve Marcus, the artist of the exhibition that's on view right now, um, mastermind behind uh, our show, all about the hot dog, which he has dubbed one of the greatest Jewish contributions to American culture. So Isaac, he currently lives and creates his artwork in his studio just a few blocks north of the museum on Manhattan's Lower East Side. And the neighborhood, uh, once the stronghold of Yiddish theater and other Jewish cultural and religious touchstones, um, this is where he's primarily lived and worked and developed an international reputation over the last 30 years. So we're really excited to have both of these people here. Um, excuse me, I'm, I'm talking about Steve Marcus right now. And let's get started with Isaac. So thank you for joining us today, all the way from Nashville. Um, I know Isaac recently moved from Brooklyn to Nashville for an exciting new career opportunity. Um, for everyone who's here with us this evening, if you have questions, please type them in the chat box. Um, we would love to hear from you, hear what stories you might have and your memories about the Isaac Gellis Delicatessen brand, um, or just memories of fun times eating hot dogs with your family, maybe at a baseball game or at a barbecue. So Isaac, thank yeah. you again for being here with us. Super cool um, to be here. Thank you for setting all of this up. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Um, why don't you get us started just by telling us a little bit about your background, um, what it was like growing up with the name Isaac Ellis while sure. you were still in the dark about the fame that Isaac Ellis Sr. had back in the day. Yeah, I uh, would love to. Um, it, you know, I uh, growing up, uh, 
I didn't really know. There was always like talk about it during family gatherings that, you know, my family had like this thing uh, called, a, you know, Isaac Ellis hot dogs or delicatessen or whatever in New York City. And I never really understood, you know, as a child, why New York City was cool or important until, um, you know, I moved to go to, to Poughkeepsie to go to culinary school in about uh, 2005, I think it was. Um, and, uh, you know, I, my dreams and aspirations back then where I just wanted to be the best chef that I possibly could be. And always while knowing, like, it was sort of like this <clears throat> funny conversation that, oh, yeah, we had a hot dog company. It was really cool, whatever. And it was, you know, I found pictures here and there about it. And, it, you know, it was just sort of like this novelty idea. But it didn't really impact me just yet. Um, while I was in culinary school at the CIA, though, uh, I had this one professor who or chef, I don't know if you call them chefs or professors, but you had this, I had this one teacher who uh, um, saw my name on my coat and he, he was, I think he was a German guy. And he said, um, hey, are you related to the hot dog people? And I go, yeah, I am. And he was like, I used to work in that factory. That was kind of step one. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. You know, tell me more about that. And, um, and he, you know, I guess he knew my family and things like that. And it was, that's when it all kind of started to peak in my mind. It was like, this might be something kind of, you know, something interesting, but whatever, you know, I'm in school, I'm in college, I'm trying to figure it out. And I did an internship at Boulay in, the, in Tribeca and then decided that in order to be a really good chef, um, I had to move to New York City and study and learn and work really hard. So I did that. Um, fortunately, my grandmother lived in Long Island at the time, uh, and so I would kind of go out to visit her every other weekend or when I had a day off to go hang out with her, and she never talked about it, never talked about it. I would ask a question, didn't really talk about it, and kind of got the feeling that it was a bit of a sore subject, so I kind of stopped asking about it, and, uh, uh, one day, I think it was 2008 or 2009, um, she mentioned to me the Elder Street Synagogue and that I had to go check it out. Uh, didn't tell me anything about it. She just said, you have to go have fun. And I was in a bar after work with a bunch of chefs uh, in Midtown. And um, uh, sure enough, on the TV in that bar was an advertisement for the opening of Elder Street. And uh, so I said, okay, this is a sign, I gotta go. And um, on my day off, I went to go check it out and I walked in through the double doors of the museum and I said, I saw Isaac Gellis carved in stone. Yeah, those doors right there. And I was like, okay, this is, this is a reality now. So this is, this is a thing that I didn't really know too much about. And um, now I get to learn about this exciting piece of history within New York City and how my family mingled into it and how I might be able to mingle into it too. Was there ever a moment of doubt for you when you saw the name Isaac Gellis that's in the marble uh, in the vestibule? Did, did you think, hey, that's, that is actually related, they're related to me. Wasn't that so surreal for you? It, it was very surreal. It was very, you know, I had to check myself. I had to like, we didn't have smartphones back then, you know, I couldn't like do a quick Google search on anything. And I would be like, I was just like, okay, what's going on here? This is kind of spooky and exciting. And, and, you know, grandma, what are you talking about? What did you set me up for? And uh, it was, um, I, I was still sort of like, like I knew my family had something to do with it, but I wasn't, I didn't know just how, how much, uh, so it was a very, so I, I the, the, uh, I think the curator at the time or the, uh, you know, I met, I met her, I can't remember her name. Um, it, it might've been Nancy Johnson, who's our curator and archivist. Oh, Nancy's shaking her head. Nancy's here with us tonight. She shakes her head. No, it's uh, been um, someone else. And, uh, I was like, I, you know, kind of sheepishly went up to the desk, you know, you go down the stairs there. Um, and there's the front desk and I, I was like, hi, um, my name is Isaac 
Gellis. And my grandmother told me I need to, to come here and take a look. And everybody went wide eyed. And uh, the conversation kind of like we're having right now started. Um, and they gave me a whole tour of the museum and it was amazing. It was, it was, it was so um, inspiring and it was, uh, gave me a sense of purpose and a sense of person um, and it, and I had no idea, you know, it was a really, it was a really like this finding myself moment. It's so incredible that you had this whole piece of your own history that uh, was missing because at Eldridge Street, we offer docent led tours. This is for anyone who's never been to the museum at Eldridge Street before. And foundational to the tour is a story about our co-founders, the people who managed to actually uh, get enough funding together to build our historic synagogue, which is a landmark synagogue today. Um, and it was the first of its kind. It was the first uh, Eastern European built synagogue by and for Eastern European Jews. Um, and we talk about Isaac Gellis, and we also talk about uh, the kosher meat boycott of 1902. So we talk about these different subjects, and yet for you, who is a direct descendant, you had no idea. So tell me a little bit more about what that did for you after. You mentioned that it prompted you to discover more about yourself, but how did that impact your path? Getting to know about the um, kosher meat boycott and, and how my family was able to maneuver around it. Um, I thought it was a fascinating story. You know, I thought that it was, uh, so for, for those who, and please correct me if I'm wrong, so for those of you who are watching, we don't know that there was uh, the price of kosher meat raised by a few pennies, I think, at the time. Right? But a few pennies at that time was a lot, right? So, uh, so people were chanting, um, what were they chanting? Like, it's too high or? They were, <laughs> yeah. The story goes, they were chanting, no meat. And the story goes that this was a, uh, a boycott that was led by the women actually who worshiped at the Elder right. Street Synagogue. And yeah. this isn't, which was so, a which was a really big deal. But yeah, I go on. There are these stories that I heard from the people at the synagogue saying, uh, you know, what you would do is before sundown, you would take a pot of a bunch of food, and I know it is cholent, but it might be, might have been anything. Who knows? And you put it in a warm oven before the oven goes off, and it cooks all through uh, Shabbat or through Sabbath, and you then have cooked food at the end of it. And so I think the question was, you know, are you, are they, who's, who's lifting up the pot and seeing who's using meat? Where's the meat coming from? And uh, I thought it was like a really fun story. Um, probably not so fun at the time though, but uh, um, it, it kind of, it kind of made me really think about, you know, how did Isaac Gellis, the original Isaac Gellis, um, interpret the needs of his community and how did Sarah Gellis interpret the needs of, of her community and how are they, how were they going to bend to it and how are they going to adapt to it and help other people? I have no idea what they were thinking at the time, of course, but you know, they did and the price of kosher meat came down and, um, people were able to purchase it again. Um, I have a strong belief as a chef that if it's quality and if it's good, people will come. But also if it's, if you're inclusive, you will get more people to come as well. So, you know, you, I think that that was sort of the move of it. That was sort of the inspiration that I took of it is, is, is this quality and can everybody get it? So Isaac, I wanna hear a little bit more about um the path that you've taken since then. I mean, we, we mentioned in the intro how you um, created a whole business making babka. Um, I know that you've, you've um, even went in so far as to creating kosher hot dogs, um, using the recipe of, uh, of your family. Could you tell uh, the audience a little bit about that story? Sure. Um, I'd love to. Uh, let's start with the hot dogs because that one came first. So that's all right. 
admittedly, they were never kosher um, when I was producing them. I know. Um, to get kosher certification would have taken the product outside of New York. And that's so I was caught up with this sort of like circumstance where I, can I make this? Is it accessible to people? Is it accessible to me? Is it a New York product? So it was all beef. Um, it was a recipe that I had found in a um, book that my aunt, when she passed away, she lived on the Upper East Side. Uh, I found a book of old, old recipes written in Yiddish or some sort of mix of English and Yiddish. And the only way I was able to understand them was because I know what a what a, a, a costing recipe is. A costing recipe is when you have a recipe and it's, you know, uh, 100 grams of beef and 100 grams of ice and 100 grams of salt and spices and then what that costs per gram and it gives you right that so that's what it was so it was it was all written out on big parchment paper and they were all folded up and looked like they'd been jammed into somebody's back pocket which anybody who's tuning in who has worked in restaurants knows exactly what that is uh and it was a really fascinating thing to me because i'm like unfolding these big notes of parchment paper that are the size of like a full baking sheet tray and it says like brisket and salt and prog powder prog powder is a as a preservative uh for curing meats and um and things like that and i was like wow this is awesome and i wrote everything down and i started testing recipes in my apartment on mott street and uh it was um a, a lot of fun and uh uh, I went to go produce these hot dogs and I was met with some challenges. A lot of people said to me, why would I buy your hot dogs when I can just buy Hebrew National or I can buy, you know, Oscar Mayer or whatever. And I was like, well, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a brand that's been around for a hundred years. Give me a chance. Right. And then DePaulo's on Mulberry Street and gave me a shot and they couldn't sell them fast enough or they couldn't buy them from me fast enough because they kept selling them. And then another grocery store and then another grocery store and then another grocery store all the way out to Montauk, all the way up to Eli's and Zabar's on the Upper East Side, West Side. Um, and that was like just a really great, like I knew that I had hit something. I knew that it was something that was sort of meant to be at the time, but yeah. And, and how much, I mean, how much of that do you think was associated with this very nostalgic aspect of the brand, of the name Isaac Ellis? I get, I get emails once a week at least from people going through my website asking if how they can still buy the hot dogs. Um, so there is, there is an attraction to it. There is an attraction to the brand. Um, there is, there are people that really, that have recognized it. I get really lovely emails from lots of people who say, I remember this when I was a child. They were the best things on the Lower East Side. They're the best things wherever. How can I get them? And, and you know, there's that sense of like food memory bringing you back to your childhood. And if this was able to do that for some people, then that's amazing. And I think that that kind of, uh, certifies it or verifies it in a way you know i i for during this whole time i was trying to get sales in uh zay bars on the upper west side and it was really really hard and zay bars is they're an institution they're busy always they probably don't have time for the little guy like me uh so i would go in there with a case of hot dogs and i'm like hey here's a sample try them out if you think they're cool i'll deliver them seven days a week whatever you want and uh they shut me down. They were like, no, you can't do this. We don't want to do this. We're too busy for us to even think about it. And I would go once a week with a case. And I'm like, please, like, you know, and the guy was like, I'm not gonna put these in my case because nobody knows who this is. I'm like, but people do, people really, really do. And so one week I, you know, I went up to this same gentleman at the counter and I was like, Hey, you know, I just thought, you know, I'd try you one more time. And he's like, he's like, man, you can't like, you're just not we're just not going to do it and i was like okay cool and i turn around and i see mr saul zabar right there and so i go up to him i go excuse me mr saul zabar my name is isaac gellis i would like to sell you my hot dogs and he says 
Isaac Ellis hot dogs like from the Lower East Side. I go, yeah, that's my family. He goes, he turns to this gentleman at the deli counter and he says, buy as much as he can give you, we will sell them. And of course they did. And it was like <laughs> the coolest thing ever. I was just like, I just connected with like, you know, New York City royalty, uh, you know, and it was just like the coolest moment where I was just like, I'm doing something right. I'm doing something that's wanted. I'm doing something that people identify with. I'm doing something that's, uh, you know, historical and cultural. And that, that was, that was like the one mo the real moment where I was like, this is, this is something that's like real and people like are cluing into it. And, uh, ever since then I keep getting these emails through the website and it's just, you know, that's, it's a driver. So I, <laughs> that's an incredible story. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about these days you see a, an incredible resurgence um, in foods that have come from very, how do I put this? I'll say humble beginnings. And, and because perhaps of the element of nostalgia, um, people are bringing them back. You have products like Gefilteria, you have even Russ and Daughters who's selling, um, I mean, they can't be busier right now yeah, right they're, they're right. fabulous An amazing um, exactly um and and even say on the lower east side i mean we still have uh, uh the iconic um pickle guys right yeah. but i think of felteria and and uh russ and daughters i think are are perhaps the the closer example to my question um what what do you think is happening there um, with this desire to take these foods uh, and bring them back today? Um, I mean, I think I think old is, you know, whatever is, is old is new or whatever is old is cool, you know, and I think that people see quality. You said the iconic pickle guy. The pickle guy isn't back then, isn't there? He, well, he, he's there still, right? He's on the corner of Essex and Grand Street. Yeah. They're, they're oh. still there. P pickled yeah, mango no. sounds weird, but it's actually pretty good. Hear me? I thought I'm muted. <laughs> it's a good question, though. We heard you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you, you know, for I, I think what what's old is is new, and and old styles come back from time to time. You know, we were talking about uh, choppers just earlier. You know, and like old motorcycles are cool again. And I don't know. Like I think I think people see heritage, and I think people see quality, and I think. People see something that reminds them of something from the past that they like to cling on to. Maybe something that their parents or their grandparents loved. And so, well, why do they love that? Maybe I should love it too. I, I think this is a great um, time to bring Steve Marcus into the fold and to, to talk about um, nostalgia and Jewish tradition um, and things that you eat and the objects that are collected. Um, someone just wrote in the comments, New York City is far less Jewish now and people are feeling nostalgic. And I think that's true, um, especially in this neighborhood, like the Lower East Side. Uh, there are so many incredible memories, a collective memory that's lived on for, for generations. Um, Steve, can you kind of maybe comment and about what you think about everything that we've just mentioned and how this has maybe even impacted your art or inspired your art? Well, I would say uh, I'm from New York and uh, I've been living in the Lower East Side in the same apartment for uh, 25 years and uh, actually around the corner from uh, Isaac Gellis's original factory, which was at 37 Essex Street. And uh, so I'm right up the block from, you know, Russ and Daughters and Katz's, which has been there since the late 19th century. And, uh, you know, I'm on the, uh, currently on the uh, age wise, you know, depending on who I talk to, but I say I'm on the old side of young and the young side of old right now. So when I was a young guy, um, the Lower East Side, definitely Essex Street, for example, every single store over there was uh was a jewish store and uh that's where you know when i got like 
my little bar mitzvah set to get my kippah and my talit and everything, get all set up for my big day. We went down to, to one of those shops and, you know, my father, blessed memory, hooked me up and he got me like, you know, he's like, you know, got me the one I liked and that was it. I was ready to, uh, to rock the day, you know? And uh, we used to go down there and get all the stuff, the pickles, the bialis and all these other things down there. And the fact of the matter is, as far as this particular neighborhood, I think New York City in general, which is really just a whole nother conversation in itself, I think that New York City is one of the things that's been interesting is that it's forever changing and constantly evolving for better or for worse. And so like with that change also comes with an influx of new residents, new people, new tastes, new desires, new interests. The fact of the matter is I don't didn't come uh, with the statistics because I wasn't necessarily expecting this uh, question or whatever. But, you know, I do know that New York City is still one of the largest uh, concentrations of Jewish people in the world. I know that uh, the Miami uh, Dade County is uh, the most diverse Jewish community outside of Israel, and, uh, and that's, which is another huge uh, Jewish community. Los Angeles. So I think, what's that? Someone said Los Someone Angeles. Someone said Los Angeles. Right, Los Angeles. My wife's originally from Chicago, also a big community. There's there's a lot of them, and uh, and it's interesting um, the way you know all these places have changed. But I think Manhattan as itself, you know, the Upper West Side, and there's still pockets here in the Lower East Side, right around the corner from the museum at Eldridge Street. There's still a lot of uh, Jewish um, synagogues down the block. There's still a yeshiva, but there's not as many of uh, kosher uh, establishments or Jewish businesses as it was so, before. So Steve, you even mentioned Katzen's Deli. Um, I want it to turn everyone's attention to uh, what we're seeing on the screen right now. Steve, uh, I know a lot of the people here, they haven't um, seen your show yet. But I'd love for you to talk maybe just a little bit about it and what what this piece is really trying, what you were trying to do with this piece. Well, for uh, to see one thing, um, you know, hopefully anybody who's local, it's like there's still a little bit of time to go down to the museum and check it out. It's like, uh, you know, the thing about uh, a story, it's best to hear it from the, the beginning, the middle and the end, you know, and not just see one or two pieces. But um Basically, the, all the show is about hot dogs um, and just a little background. It was inspired by my nephew, who's six years old now. At the time he was five, I have a off the grid uh, cabin up in the mountains in the Catskills and uh, in the Western Catskills and, uh, and basically came up there for my birthday. And uh, he loves hot dogs. And so I had hot dogs. And he made me a card, a birthday card that he drew myself, which has been one of our family traditions is to make the card. And uh, basically he drew me and him sitting on a rock with hot dogs on sticks and uh, up in the mountains. And, uh, and then I said, oh, wow, it's like I went to go get a stick. I made a campfire and he roasted his first hot dog on a stick. And when I came back to see how he was doing, I was setting up the little you know, picnic table and getting everything together or whatever. I came by to see how he was doing. I said, how, how's it going? He said, Uncle Steve, this is one of my dreams coming true. And then I've decided to make the hot dog art. And because of my uh, relationship to New York, the New York hot dog is, you know, world famous, you know, and uh, basically because I'm interested in creating like uh, Jewish pop art, you know, I started to uh, create this show. And this particular piece, Rabbi Frank in the Frank Tank, is kind of a uh, little bit of a, uh, of a, um, I guess, an illustration of uh, the Chabad mitzvah tank, right? And the Chabad guys are like out there with their RVs, right? With the, that they call the mitzvah tank, and it's kind Thanks. of mobile. Um, kind of like um, outreach 
vehicle for um, to get people to get connected to their Jewish roots and culture and practices. And so um, I made the, and they always park wherever there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people, right? And so uh, I made this piece, which is obviously with Katz's, with the uh, mitzvah tank, which is really, you know, a uh, Oscar Mayer wiener mobile. And, uh, you know, I like, um, I've always been interested in things that have motors as well. And uh, so like I was able to also, was very excited about the history of the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile, which was also quite fascinating. So really it's like, um, that's what this particular piece is about. It's really inspired by the Chabad mitzvah tanks and the work that Chabad does and parked out front of Katz's Delicatessen. And uh, so, and it has, uh, so I, I personally yeah. like this piece and a lot of people do as well, you know. Steve, you know, if I may, um, you know, we were talking about and you know, how, what I like about your art earlier uh, is that it shows sort of the, the busyness of the Lower East Side and something that's now just kind of cluing into me as you're talking about this is that there's a, there, if I may say so, there's a, a very timeless quality to like, I don't know when this could have been, this painting could have been uh, done of, of a scene from yesterday, or it could have been done from a scene from 30 years ago, or, you know, it could have been done from a scene from 60 years ago, or anywhere in between. And I think that that's what's super cool about it, commenting back on the nostalgia question uh, that we, that you asked earlier. Um, I think that this is something that sort of, you know, like everybody knows what hot dogs are, and everybody, well, almost everybody likes hot dogs. And and I think that the cool thing, and there's somebody that's watching named uh, uh, Jenna, who's an artist friend of mine, said to me one time, the cool thing about New York City is you can go to any street corner and you can see something historic, something artistic, something interesting at any given time of the day ever. And, uh, or day or night. And I think that, you know, the, the nostalgia and the artwork that you make um, really captures that and really shows that, that sort of like this is, you know, people come to New York City looking for a future, looking for a career, looking to grow themselves. And then once they're in it, they look up and they see the buildings and they realize that there's tons of history and tons of culture and tons of food culture during times of, you know, the, the synagogue was, Isaac Gell's provision started in, in 1800s, right? There's civil uh, unrest, there's wars, there's class wars, there's development, there's the sprawl across the United States into the West. And yet I feel like these paintings could have been taken place during almost any, during, during any most of those times. Thank you. I mean, that's ultimately, you know, art should be in some way timeless and not a fad, right? It's like, you know, it shouldn't just be speaking to the moment, it should be speaking to uh, eternity, right? And that's why there's like, museums are filled with these paintings from thousand years ago, 500 years ago, and all these things, and they still speak to people. So it's a lovely thing that you said. Thanks so much. Oh, yeah. I mean, I hope I, hope I hit it. I hope I hit it right. <laughs> so someone, uh, I think, Isaac, you said, I think everyone, hopefully, maybe everyone likes hot dogs. We actually have someone who commented and said, I'm watching from Vancouver, Canada. And I can confidently say that I am built 75% entirely of hot dog and 100% miss New York or miss the Lower East Side. Thank you for this talk. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we should take a little poll. Um, and I'd like for everyone to just put in the comments their favorite, this can be controversial, I know, their favorite uh, brand of hot dog so we can just see. Um, what people what people put in there if it is uh oscar meyer as you pointed out or if it's a hebrew national or cons or you know any of these um brands a and got a lot of gellises got a lot of gellises on this chat yeah we sure do um someone wrote during world war ii isaac gellis had a saying send a salami to a boy in the army. <laughs> and someone Thank else you, said, I'm lucky enough to have had Gellis's dogs. I'll go with those. Uh, 
the person that said that JB uh, is a restaurateur that uh, we worked together for several years. We opened up a New York style delicatessen in London together. And I was lucky enough to bring the rest of the Isaac hot dog recipe to London and uh, we produced them for a while. Um, and uh, uh, it was really great to have a lot of New Yorkers coming through that restaurant identifying with that and it was like a it was a treat that I wasn't really expecting you know and 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 it was really cool just to just kind of do that so yeah, thanks JB for all that and I guess this is also a great moment just um opening this up to the audience keep keep these answers going there's some really uh <laughs> very passionate people are are responding right now um, you know you someone's you asked, asked Someone's asked, where can we buy Isaac Ellis hot dogs in New Jersey? I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I knew, you know, when I, when I moved to, uh, to, to, when I moved to London to do that, that delicatessen, unfortunately the, the operation came with me um, and uh, I wasn't able to grow it to a place of sustainability to be able to continue making them without me driving it so unfortunately they're not for sale at the moment and it's heartbreaking for me to say that every time well um someone else just wrote in the chat uh this is todd also a great great grandson of isaac gellis i think it would be fun to have a reunion of descendants both from isaac gellis and other founding families at the museum at eldridge street so we, I think we do have quite a few descendants here on this call today. So if you're, if this sounds like something you're interested in, I mean, sure, let's do it. You can, uh, you can find us. Come by the, come by the museum. Any other questions, folks have? Um, I think I would personally really like to uh, hear a little bit more about, I guess. The personal journey, um, Isaac. How that sort of. Well, you know, you you asked me about Bobka, and I didn't didn't really answer it. Um, that might be part of that journey. Sure, I think so. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, you know, so after coming to the synagogue for the first time, and then docenting there for a brief, very brief period of time and getting to understand a, a lot about my family's history and how it might be involved in the synagogue uh, in New York City. Uh, through a friend, I met a gentleman named Scott Wiener who does Scott's Pizza Tours. You can find him on Instagram, who does historical walking tours of the village that talks about the development of pizza in New York City. Super cool. Um, and he turned me on to the Municipal Archives building in Lower Manhattan. Uh, he turned me on to a lot of ways to research immigration into New York City from during the 1800s. Uh, and I was able to find the ship's manifests of Sarah and Isaac Gellis, a lot of other Gellises, uh, and just sort of like get sort of an idea of what it must have been like to immigrate to New York City during that time. Um, and uh, I think that what I started to realize through Isaac Gellis Delicatessen is that Sarah and Isaac, especially Sarah, um, drove this idea of supporting communities and helping communities and helping to be and, and being a part of communities, whether a matriarch, patriarch, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, if you're living in a place, you got to be a part of that place. Um, so I think that that was a huge message to me, getting to know um, my, you know, building this imaginary, what I think it, they may have been like, what I think the Lower East Side may have been like, um, and uh, just trying to under, like, understand what living in New York City could have been like in the 1900s, but you have Italian people and, and Chinese people and Jewish people all living within walking distance with each other. It's very exciting. Um, there's a really great book by, I think it's the, named uh, John Reese, the, How the Other Half Lives, right? Does that ring, book ring a bell? Well, is it, he was, so he was a, a beat cop on Mulberry Street 
uh, during the late 1800s, early 1900s, where he talked about the struggles he had um, mingling through all these different cultures. And then he wrote a book about it. And it's really interesting. It's a, it's a quick read, but it's a really good read. And, uh, and I suggest you check it out. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I, I decided at that moment where this had to be a part of my life, this had to be a part of my career, whether it's hot dogs or something else. Uh, and, it, and it became, a, it became a, a big driver for me. Um, it, you know, it gave me a sense of place, a sense of purpose. Um, and then also I was working in nice restaurants at the time. So I knew that I had the skills for it. Uh, so, uh, you know, fast forward to 2019, you know, opening a really great delicatessen in London, um, really exploring my voice through Jewish food, like latkes, cholent, matzo ball soup, whatever you want to call it, um, opening a, a kosher steakhouse in Cedarhurst, Long Island, and exploring that sort of food and how to make it and how to be part of that community. Um, and then fast forward to 2019, uh, a lot of, you know, Black Lives Matter started becoming um, a very important topic and a very important issue. And it always has been, but now it was like really, it was really in the spotlight at that time. And, uh, you know, it was in the pandemic. Um, New York City got locked down. I had my last haircut on fe in February, I think February 12th of 2019. And uh, uh, I felt completely and utterly powerless. I lost my job. I lost my career. I lost my industry. I wasn't even able to go outside to walk, in, walk around in the community anymore. At that time, people didn't really understand COVID. So there was a lot of fear in New York City. Um, and I felt it, I felt it in many levels. So then Black Lives Matter started becoming, uh, you know, very into the media. I, you, you know, I saw it everywhere. I think all of us did. Um, and I decided at that point that I'm not powerless. I'm not helpless. I do have skills, I am a part of the community, and I was able to reinvigorate my, my using the brand that I had already established with the hot dogs, reinvigorate myself and my trade to produce babka to sell across the country to help donate to my community. Because I was living in bed at the time. bed is a African-American, Caribbean, and dominantly black community. And, uh, but previously to that, it was also a Jewish community. So I was felt like it was a really great mingling of all of that. And I was able to support both sides of both cultures, of all these cultures with babka. To me, it was like a no brainer. I was like, this is amazing. This is, this is, and I, I started small um, and I got some support from some people and my mom and dad bought me a printer so I could buy, so I could uh, print out shipping labels faster. I was writing them all by hand. Um, other people would donate uh, more money for supplies and things like that. I bought everything at the family dollar um, to save on costs so I could donate more. Um, but uh, it, it just seemed like such an enabling thing to do to be able to, you know, do this on, on the dime, on a, on a penny and be able to donate to everyone. Um, and that, that sort of was the driver behind it was, you know, mingling wow. of cultures in one neighborhood. If, it, wow. if I may, uh, I started to read the comments. I've been like so fascinated. I've just been listening and Thank I've you. also been, uh, started to read the comments and uh, I just wanted to address two of them, if I may. Sure. One of them, um, Abby Eckstein asked if I was familiar with uh, the art of Harry uh, Glaubach. And uh, I know this is, I just have to do this. I don't know if you could see that back there, but there, right there, is actually a Harry Glaubach piece in my, uh, cool. in, in my home. And I just wanted to if anybody doesn't know, he is just an incredible New York classic folk art guy. He is just amazing. 
and was just did all these things on Yankee Stadium and um, all these places. And when I was a little squirt and we used to go to these Jewish delicatessens and all these places, when you had to wait for a table, they were like packed. He had his artwork in like these, the sitting areas and all these different places. And it was just everywhere. And I was in love with his work as a child. Like I would just sit there and just be amazed at, uh, I just thought it was so cool. And so the way I got to acquired this piece actually, when I was young and really kind of like uh, running around New York City, um, which was really in the, my time was in the nineties and I was, you know, staying out late at night and doing, you know, the, whatever I was doing. One night I had stayed out all night, hanging out with friends. I was walking up the block, crossing University Place and they were about to have this art uh, on the avenue kind of thing where all these artists were coming to like hang up their stuff on this outdoor display and sell their work. And it was so early that there was like, they were really just putting up the little things and pulling up their cars and the police had blocked off the street. And I'm walking up the block and I see this old guy there, this like, just this, just this old character, you know, he looked like he's out of like some Norman Lear TV show or something, this guy. And he's got the trunk of his old beat up car and whatever. And I'm walk right by him and I look in the trunk of the car and it's got all this artwork in it. And it's, and it's Harry Goldblatt. I said, oh my God, are you this? Are you this guy? I said, I didn't even know his name. I said, are you this guy? Did you make this? He looked at me, he was like, yeah, I made this. I'm the guy. I said, oh my God. I said, started telling him out when I was a kid and blah, 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 and all this stuff. I was like pouring out my, uh, all these like childhood memories to this total strange old man, you know? And he, and he said to me, you want to buy something or what? So I told him, <laughs> So I told him, I was like, I was like, for sure, man, how much, how much is it? And uh, he took them all out. He took them all right there. He took them out, whatever. And, uh, and I said, wow, I really like this one. He said, it's this much, kid. I was like, that's what's up. I took out, had the money in my pocket and like gave him the money. And uh, he signed it on the back, like to Steve and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And uh I'm just like adore his work. And it's like, they still have uh, people like sell them sometimes on uh, eBay and different things or whatever. But he's like, to me, like a real sleeping giant. He's like just a, an incredibly, like uh, just, an inc just made a great contribution locally in the tri-state area for sure. They had his stuff in New Jersey, Long Island and just all around. He was like really something I, and definitely like a, a secret influence on my work and to see somebody mention him, like I said, Abby X, F, X team mentioned him. It's just, it's amazing. It, and it kind of goes to show is something that New York has taught me is you never know how talented the person sitting right next to you is, <laughs> right? Like you meet some dude selling art out of the trunk of their car and then all of a sudden they're like, somebody yeah, like your child, person. your childhood, uh, your childhood uh, hero. Yeah. Well, Abby, Abby says we have three of Harry's pieces in our kitchen, and well, I guess we'll have to add some of Steve's work. All right. So you might be uh, on the wall right next to some of your hero's work. And the, the other thing that uh, I just wanted to address briefly is that um, you know, not to get too personal, but um, Barry Feldman, um, he had mentioned like that he liked the the one piece that the people saw from the show. He said that, you know, Katz's is in kosher. And uh, an interesting story was that uh, originally Katz's was owned by a different family, actually. And uh, there was just a few years where it was actually kosher. And, uh, and then when the Katz family bought it, it, it's obviously not been kosher since 1889. And, uh, and the interesting thing was that I had an exhibition at the Jewish Museum of Florida in Miami. And this guy came up to me, a lovely guy. And uh, he came up to me and he said, my family started 
Katz's, we sold it to the Katz's or whatever. And it was such, he's such a cool guy. He's, he lives in the upper uh, east side and is just a lovely person. Had like this fascinating conversation. And uh, the reason that uh, when Barry Feldman said that, it's like, uh, you know, it's important to say what's uh, kosher and not kosher. I'm actually kosher myself. So I actually don't eat there and I walk by it uh, almost every day. So, you know, it's something I'm familiar with. But then again, regarding that piece, Kabad's always trying to uh, get the people that I guess you would say aren't kosher. So, uh, you know, so it's like an, a good place to park, but it is true what Barry said. So that's, uh, that's, that's what a, something. what a New York story. Yeah. And, I, and I, I also want to say related with Isaac Gellis in the, in the exhibition, you know, it, it's like, it also includes some of the memorabilia. I'm a big collector, not just of hot dog things of, of really all things, New York and, really all things curious, you know, in general, I've been in, it's like, uh, was involved in antiquarian pursuits and, you know, into book, rare books and all different kinds of things and have a lot of punk rock and different things or whatever. But one of the pieces that's included in this show was from 1929, which was the promotional Haggadah from Isaac Gellis that Whoa. he gave to his customers. And uh, it's a full, complete Haggadah Kids, it's like you could use it for your seder at uh, Passover on Pesach, and uh, so that's that's in the show, and uh, that's like a that's a real gem of a that's just a gem. And even though you could only see the cover, and the it's like uh, it is actually complete, and it's uh, it's in top top, almost mint uh, condition. So it's like a very uh, special thing. So if seeing these examples of Steve's work was not enticing enough for our viewers tonight. Uh, come before the show closes on November 6th to see uh, the Haggadah for yourself. Um, that's really incredible that you have that, um, that copy and we're so fortunate that you brought it to the museum. Um, before, uh, we're sort of winding down now. Um, and I wanna thank everyone for being here. So many of the family of the Gellis family being here tonight. Also, um, I wanna acknowledge actually uh, someone in the Winters family, Allison Winters, their family actually donated the photo of Isaac Gellis um, to Eldridge Street. Um, but I feel that I can't, we can't just talk about Isaac Gellis without talking about his wife, Sarah who uh, plays a, a fairly important role in the story um, of, of the Eldridge Street Synagogue and also um, of the Gellis business. So I wanted to mention that um, Sarah Gellis uh, actually was um, a very involved member of the community. Um, and we, we've, based off of the records that we've, we've found, um, was very much a role model for the women in the community. Um, in fact, after Isaac Ellis's death in 1906, um, she continued to be involved in the business, I believe, um, and the community for the next 20 or so years. Um, and she was actually uh, one of the few, or I guess one of the first women, um, in fact, who uh, who was able to have a greater stake within the congregation. So uh, actually the widows of members were able to become full-fledged members of the Eldridge Street Synagogue. And we know that likely she was one of the, um, the people who instigated, instigated that. So Isaac, do you have any stories that you might have of Sarah Gellis? We know that she passed when she was 80 years old um, and Isaac passed when he was around 55 years old. You know, I, I, I don't have any specific stories about Sarah Gellis, but I, all the things that I've ever read was that she was a huge staple in the community um, and a big support uh, for a lot of people. Um, uh, when it came to, you know, making sure everyone was fed, she was the one that would do um, like charitable drives to make sure, you know, 
that there might be uh, food for people in the community that couldn't afford to buy food. Um, there were drives to hospitals uh, there were, or um, children's food drives and things like that. And then she was, it was my understanding that she was the one that sort of directed all those things and made them happen. So it was really, uh, I think, you know, the matriarch of the community. I think that that's what she was. Um, but I don't, I don't, I wish I had more specific stories about her. Well, we also know that um, in 19, I think around 1919, um, when, when American women, uh, American white women received the right to vote, um, the congregation, they actually formed the Ladies Auxiliary and it helped the, it helped women organize uh, for the community in I think in a more official way. And mm -hmm. actually we have another descendant here um, who might, she says she can speak a little bit about Sarah. Um, she's in fact the person who um, their family donated the photo of Isaac Gellis. And she says that uh, the only image she has of Sarah Gellis is the one from the newspapers after she was robbed. So oh, yeah. perhaps yeah. perhaps we can invite Sarah to, um, I mean, Allison to unmute herself and maybe chime in. What a happy moment. Yeah. Hi. Okay, I'm, I think I'm unmuted now. So first of all, hello to some of the relatives that I may know or have met before and those that I haven't. I'm 60 years old, so it's really nice to meet you after all this time, so that's pretty cool. So um, my family is, uh, we are the females that descended from the business, which is a whole different story. Uh, the business primarily were with the male uh, descendants with that, but uh, the stories that I had heard over the years was um, not only was Sarah sort of a, a big person with personality and everything that she did, um, much like my grandmother, who was her granddaughter, uh, but just her physical strength was uh, quite amazing. And some of the stories about how she'd pick up a slab of meat and throw it on the counter and do different things was pretty amazing. And uh, if some have not seen, the only uh, photos I've been able to find that I um, that Sophie just mentioned were some stories in the newspaper uh, where she had been robbed, you know, and basically would fight off those people that would trail her, you know, carrying cash, presumably maybe in her bra or under her dress, coming home from the deli and ju just a really tough, tough woman. So as a uh, descendant of hers, um, I'm not as I'm not big physically like she is, but it's nice to know that uh, there was a big personality that was that was there, and uh, that was um, you know really good to know uh, about. And uh, I did take it upon myself uh, just recently during the COVID period to visit the Gellis family um, where they are buried in Queens, and that was pretty fascinating uh, to uh, to see that. So so now hello to everybody. And Isaac, uh, nice to meet you here. Thank you for this. Well, thank you for that. Wow, I thank have, you so I much. I have heard that story uh, of Sarah Gillis throwing slabs of meat on the table and cooking them up somehow. Um, you know, I, I think this, the, from what I've read of her um, giving nature and then also her robustness to be able to do things like that, I, I just get this sense that she must have been a very soulful human. I hope so, it sounds good. So we just have time for maybe two or three questions left. Um, Fran Friedman uh, has a question for Isaac. And, sure. and Fran was wondering, why do you think, if you know, uh, that your grandmother was so reluctant to talk about the Gellis legacy or history? I don't, I don't really know, and I can see through the chats that my father and aunts and uncles are also here, hi. Um, so they might know, but uh, I, don't, I don't really know. I think there might have been maybe a, a family feud in the past, but there also may have been just a sense of moving on and, you know, kind of over it, so. Uh, I, I don't know why she never really talked to me about it. You know, I, I didn't really get to know my grandmother. I always knew her as a child, but I didn't really get her to open up to me until I was in my mid-20s, and she told me all about her life. Um, 
you know, of, of her growing up and, and meeting my grandfather and having my, uh, my uncle, like, you know, as when they were kids and raising my, my uncles and my father when they were kids. And, um, I heard all about that, but she just, whenever that topic came up, she just, you know, short, quick answer. That's it. You know, so I don't, I don't know why, um, she never really wanted to talk about it. Um, but, uh, maybe I, I believe it was just a sense of like, it was in the past for her and didn't, didn't really have an interest. Allison, did you find that your family had similar, um, well, we were we were sort of the least involved with with the with the business just because again um, uh, we're I'm a descendant of one of one of the daughters. Uh, so, but uh, that said, our uh, claim to fame over many years, I never had any hesitation being in the New York area talking about uh, Isaac Ellis being a great great grandfather to me. So that was always a fun thing to talk about. But uh, again, you know we. Um, our lineage from the, the, the business was sort of cut off many, 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 many years back. Uh, but what was really amazing for me was when my mother and her brother visited Eldridge thinking that Isaac was just a member and uh, she was greeted by some people after she mentioned his name. And it was fascinating to know that he was one of the founders. And ironically, at that, that time, my son was in middle school, literally around the corner from the museum. So to go back to a place where we can say, hey, our descendants sat here, prayed here, you know, lived here 150, 50 years before you know, in the United States, uh, that was pretty fascinating. So that was really wonderful. And uh, it's a place that I now adore and love and did visit it recently. So I did see the art exhibit and it really was lovely. So thank you, Steve, for that. Oh, wow. That's great. One of, one of the things I love about your art, Steve, is, uh, it seems like you spent all huge chunks of your life diving into these cultures and these communities and really understanding the people and the places that you're in. Um, it's really, it was really inspirational to just kind of poke around your website and look at your work and just be like, wow, this, this dude kind of knows this culture. This dude kind of knows what's going on here is, you know, we were talking about Cuba earlier, you know, it's like, you know, you really did a really great job at capturing the, the feel and the vibe of whatever, whatever that, it, you know, that scene is, you know, and like, that's how I kind of remember it in my head, right? Like going to go get hot dogs at, uh, in Coney Island or, or, uh, Katz's or whatever. Oh yeah. Or Midtown even, I don't know. <laughs> well, the world's a beautiful, inspiring place, right? And it's like, it's look forward to seeing more of the world, you know, I think 2023, yeah. I'm going to do a little traveling. So we'll see what comes out of all of that i see a, a question from seville uh wiener can we buy your babka now um so i i did babka for in 2019 um and uh i when the media shifted from from focusing on black lives matters uh and george floyd and when that shifted to the presidential election Unfortunately, sales dropped so quickly. It was a heartbreaking moment for me because I figured that I was, you know, I, I would, I was producing, uh, you know, seven dozen a day. I was working 17 hours a day in my little apartment in Brooklyn. And then it just kind of stopped. And I was like, well, shoot, this sucks. And I, I got really upset about why um, popular media would shift so hard away from such an important topic i mean both topics were quite important but it was like one or the other and uh um so you know it was a thing that i did for uh for charity and unfortunately my bakery apartment <laughs> i don't live in anymore so i'm not producing them anymore however if i could do that job the rest of my life i'd be a pretty happy guy thank you so I think that's all we have time for tonight. And I would say that, um, Isaac, I think we are now finally rekindled um, the, the Eldridge Gellis um, conversation there. So we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep our tabs on you and let our audience know if there are ever um, any kind of updates um, about what you're doing. Sure. And, and so people can, can uh, you can actually sign up on our mailing list on our website and you'll be able to stay updated on news. 
And we also have um, Steve's show, uh, Top Dog of Kosher Pop Art, which is closing on November 6th. Um, so catch it before it closes. The museum is open Sunday through Friday from 10 to 5. Um, and you'll get to learn a lot about uh, the art. And you'll even, as Nancy said um, in the chat, you'll get to hear uh, him speak and talk about the works and hear some stories as well. So thank you all so much. Um, I know that some of you have requested a, a Zoom family reunion. Um, perhaps uh, you'll be able to, to find time to do that uh, another day. And this movie has instigated a beautiful um, connection there. So I wanna thank you all again for being here and being interested in the subject and especially thanking Isaac and Steve and also uh, to Allison for jumping in. Yeah. Thank you very much for setting this up. Um, it was a pleasure meeting you, Allison, and Steve is really cool. I hope that we can connect again in the future, for sure. I wish I was in New York City with you all right now. Down on a sea in Nashville. Do it. Yeah, yeah. cool. <laughs> Thank you all so much. All, all right. right, take care, everyone. Thank take care. you. Hope uh, to see bye. you at the museum. Um, I have uh, opened up the unmute capability. So if anyone wants to just say goodbye, you can feel free to do that. And as Maya said, she's going to be sending the recording out next week, along with more information about Steve's show. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, thank you bye so bye, much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Bye. 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 <laughs> So I see, I see Andy is, is here. That's, I believe is my uncle. He is a so- Hi, huge, Isaac. Huge How are you doing, source. Isaac? <laughs> hey, Uncle Andy. He is a huge source of information um, and resources about the delicatessen as well. He's done a lot of research on his own. Excellent. Andy has some good- uh, I, I've also been in touch with uh, many of the great people at uh, Eldridge Street Synagogue through the years. Uh, I had done the Across the Sea of Time movie for IMAX that ran in New York for a long period of time and wow. uh, tracked, tracked Eldridge Street while it was going through its renovation. I actually was given a, uh, an aliyah on Simchas Torah down oh, wow. in, the in the downstairs synagogue <laughs> when I showed up there one day. It was quite amazing. Uh, wow. they, made the, they made me carry the Torah around the synagogue, <laughs> trip, a trip and a half. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's yeah, incredible. You know, it's, it, it, it's interesting. The, the, the question about, um, you know, why uh, Isaac was referring to uh, my mother um, when he was talking about, uh, you know, getting information. Um, she didn't have a lot of information, which is why a lot of it wasn't transmitted. Um, and that's primarily because um, my dad and Isaac's grandfather never really talked a huge amount about it. And myself and my brothers, we all actually worked at 37 Essex Street in our youth. Um, and, and actually my brothers in there um, uh, after college even, uh, at least my oldest brother. And, um, you know, it was day-to-day -day business and somehow the history of it all never really was front and center. Uh, we all knew it was established in 1872. So we all knew um, what that great legacy was. And Eldridge Street was in oh. ruins at the time. So. On Isaac's thing. Go, Isaac! Yeah. Hey, Chelsea. Hello. <laughs> hey, Don. These, these are my two food and beverage directors. They're in Nashville. They're <laughs> my team watching us right now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> We're so proud. Proud of you. Thank you. Hi there. Well, I mean, um, Andy, it's great to meet you. Um, Eldridge has, has come far I think since uh since oh yeah we, absolutely uh, you were learning about Eldridge Street um and I'm sorry if, if we haven't kept in touch over these years but here's a new opportunity so if you have stories that um you'd like to share with us anything else that um you might be interested in in learning more about too about maybe even all the other co-founders just please let me know. Uh, my email address is slo at eldridgestreet.org. 
um, you can just write to me and we'd love to have you at the museum and just come for a chat, just like Isaac did when he came by. Here's a, here's a really interesting thing that if you're in New York City that you can just go and do. Uh, you can go to the Municipal Archives building and you can sort through miles of microfiche. Uh, during the early, like 1920s, I think they tried to put, photograph every single address in Manhattan, but never got above 11th Street. And you can find 37 Essex Street with Isaac Ellis in lights up seven stories. Um, and you can, you can find that that negative and order a print of it um, or any other address in the Lower East Side. So if you yourself have some sort of a connection with New York City, that might be a really fun project for anybody to do that research with. That, that picture is actually available if you dig deep into Google. I have all those pictures that I got offline. Oh, wow. So oh. It, it's quite remarkable. I mean, if you actually spend the time and go pages and pages deep into it, um, you, find, you find amazing stuff. I mean, finding the, uh, the, the son's uh, obit of Isaac Ellis was really um, a revelation because it made it seem like he was the Beyonce of his time, um, you know, where they had people lined up for miles, you know, for his funeral procession. Uh, he had that much of an impact on the, on the neighborhood. Uh, it's, you know, it's an interesting legacy for sure. Um, and unfortunately, too much of it has been lost um, for seemingly ever. <laughs> which is sad and, and you know certainly trying to go back to uh, reference the old country has become pretty much impossible to do it, it, yeah I think that Sophie and Maya that's so the work that you two do is so important for just the reasons that my uncle just said and for the other other family and other cultural points too and, and the other thing to yeah, point that's out the York, too I'm that's sorry, the New York I... Times uh, obit but the uh, the Sun obit which uh, if I could, well, I can't post it up, but I can send it along people. if nobody found it. Yeah, the 14,000 people that, is, that attended. But also what was important was even after he passed away, that Sarah lived in the community for so many years uh, down the street. It's now a Baptist church uh, on Henry Street, I'm getting the exact address, which is pretty cool. And I've gone by there a few times and she stayed in the neighborhood, uh, whereas many people uh, went, no went north, further north originally. So that was that was pretty cool, too. Wow. Yeah, they, they actually had multiple property properties on Henry Street, it seems. So they're the landlords of Henry Street, something or other. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you that. all again. I hope this is the beginning of um of a family reunion or reconnecting of family stories and um can learn a little bit more about the people, your history, where you came from, who you came from, um, and your legacy today. And if you want to come see Isaac Gellis in marble, and if you haven't been here yet, um, shoot me an email. We'd love to have you here uh, in person. 